Hello and welcome to another live inspirational common unity collaboration show. My name is Mark Abadi. That is one word, Mark Abadi, Mark Abadi, like marking a body, Mark Abadi. Um, I, it is Wednesday, Witchy Wizardy Wednesday, which is why we're talking about magic. And what magic we've got is otherwise known as science. Uh, of course, magic is magic until it's science. And um, we've got a wonderful guest. I'm so happy to have him on. Uh, it, it is Professor Gerald Pollock, or Jerry. Uh, he's a, a, a phenomenal British scientist, um, worked with uh, biology and, bio, and, and the biophysics now. Uh, but his, one of his first books was Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, an excellent textbook for um, biological understanding. He's now working with water, and in particular, the fourth phase of water, which is a phenomenal uh, uh, aspect of water we're going to hear all about. Let me tell you about Jerry. Uh, he's going to share his fantastic discoveries about the behavior of water in the body and how it might explain previously misunderstood um, movement of power and energy. Uh, Jerry maintains an active lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's the founding editor-in-chief of Water, a multidisciplinary research journal, executive director of the Institute for uh, Venture Science, co-founder of the Fourth Phase Inc., and founder of the annual conference on physics, chemistry, and biology of water. He's received numerous honors, uh, including the Prigogini Medal, for thermodynamics, and um, Pergagini was, remember, we talked about the scientists who, who showed that tiny things have massive impacts on the quantum level. Um, and the University of Washington annual faculty lecturer, uh, he's phenomenal, basically. One of the things that he does at Pollock Labs is they want to challenge the, 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 the dogma with fresh ideas that explain more um, the, the, the elements of, of, of improving science and enterprise can be outside of the established dogma um, because its science has become increasingly conservative and, and separate. Now there's a rejoining where bio, biology joins with physics and physics with chemistry. And, and that is the essence. So you can find out more at Pollock Lab, uh, pollocklab.org. Wonderful. Okay, so without further ado, let us go over to Jerry. Jerry, thanks for the show. Uh, this I just had to um, uh, first correct a minor misunderstanding. Uh, while I would really like to be uh, British, I'm not. I what? come from New York. I am not uh, think you're British. Well, well, you know, it was the, the greatest desire of <laughs> most scientists coming to New York to divest themselves of the, their New York acts you see, and, and transition toward a British accent because as one colleague told, you know, a guy can stand up and present a seminar and uh, if he presents it with a dark accent, no, nobody will believe a word. On the other hand, a British subject can get up and speak the purest of and everybody would be impressed. So <laughs> starting from graduate school onward, I know that many of us uh, attempted um, uh, without much success to transition from a New York accent to a British accent. So thank you very much for the compliment, but I, right. I, I don't hail from London or anywhere near. I don't understand. Maybe that's how I get away with talking such shit. Um, but, you know, I think it was, I met you at uh, May Wan Ho's uh, conference. I think that's where we first met her water conference. Yeah, in and London. Yeah. A, what a wonderful being May Wan was. And, and still energetically is. Um, you know, one of the things that drew me there was how she linked, um, you know, these old separate notions of science, the, the chemistry of science and the biology of science with the physics of science. Um, could, you, could you talk about sort of the evolution of, of, of why science needs to um, incorporate both the physics and biophysics of things? Well, there's, uh, there's really no distinction between uh, physics and biophysics, and for that matter, between physics and chemistry. It's all one science, and, uh, and uh, the, any boundaries that are established between them are artificial. Because, you know, take yourself, your, your body, you think of it as biochemistry, but 
uh, but you can't get away from physics because physics underlies all of the uh, of the chemistry. But that's not your question. Your 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 question deals with the conservatism of science, and I think science has gone astray. Um, uh, the and, and science has gone astray because of the reward system. So it used to be a hundred years ago that science was pretty much open. If you have a new idea, you present your new idea and, um, and you need to convince a handful of people because after all, science was not the massive endeavor that it is today. Uh, and if you could convince a few people, then your idea might be accepted. And there were many revolutions in science at the beginning of the 20th century, mostly in physics. Uh, every year, practically, something new and revolutionary came. But modern science is different. Uh, modern science is institutional. It's supported not by uh, generous donors who believe in a scientist uh, in general, um, or not by scientists coming from uh, wealthy families and the families are interested in supporting the science It's supported by institutions and we all know how institutions work they try hard to do what's right but ultimately they often fail and the failure is uh, illustrated I guess let me illustrate um, suppose you mark suppose you have an idea um, that the earth is a sphere but everybody else knows it's flat and if you if you look out, um, you know, out your window, everything looks kind of flat. And so you can extrapolate and presume that the entire earth is flat. And, and you have an idea it, um, based on some, quote, preliminary data, unquote, that the earth is actually round, right? And you want to get money to study this because, it's, after all, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty important. And you even have so-called preliminary data, which means you have some inkling that uh, from some evidence that really the earth might be round. You've seen satellite photos, for example, looks round, doesn't look flat. Right. Uh, and on your way to Hawaii, um, you, uh, you looked out, out the window of a plane and you were looking for the edge of a flat earth. And, and however conscientiously you looked, you couldn't find it. And so, and in fact, your previous trip around the world, the same thing. You looked out the window, you looked yeah. for the edge, that sharp edge, couldn't find it, and actually were able to go all the way around the world and come back where you came from. So, so you apply to a science foundation because without money, you can't really do very much. And um, though you're extremely well in a place in, in Hawaii, must be very... Um, uh, you don't have enough money to support your own research, so you need some money. So you send in to, say, the National Science Foundation, and the gatekeeper looks at your application. Hmm, a body. Uh, he's proposing what? That the Earth is round? Everybody knows it's flat. But this looks pretty important, and because it looks important, we should really recruit the most prominent scientists dealing with the shape of the earth um, and let them review this and see if, uh, if this radical idea of a round earth has a merit or doesn't have merit. Mm -hmm. And so they recruit. So who do they recruit? Well, people they recruit are the experts in flat earth. If the New York Times wants to find out something about the latest bumps discovered on the flat earth, they'll go to these people, no, certainly to mark a body. So mm -hmm. you're up application is then reviewed by by these distinguished people and you can imagine um, these people are not biased they've built their careers on the flatness of the earth and the last thing they want they want is to be displaced right and so they take your application and uh, there may be a committee of a dozen people or two of whom or three have read your application and of course the last thing they want is where you get money because if you challenge them, if you happen to be right, they're wrong. Right. And if they're wrong, uh, they get displaced from their exalted positions mm -hmm. uh, in science. So it's human nature. You know, we're self-protective. We don't we don't want to be displaced. Uh, others. You can imagine the response. Uh, oh yeah. Well, you know, it's a pretty improbable. It's rather. Yeah. Yeah. 
he hasn't dealt with the right statistical analysis. So yeah. to rewrite it. Anyway, don't get money. Yeah. That, that's, that's the bottom line. And so people with radical ideas understand if they want to keep their money or get their money to do research, don't apply for anything that sounds too radical, which means science doesn't advance the way it should be advancing. Mm. I'll stop. There's more, but I'll stop yeah, here because yeah. you're about to ask a few other No, no, I, I, I get the point of that. I, um, you know, my, it, it seems like with regards to the um, medical world, which is, you know, you're involved with because you're looking at the biological systems of humans. Um, it, it seems like there's a massive vested interest, obviously, from the pharma cartel. And, um, Absolutely. and, and the, I suppose my question is, with regards to the funding that goes on, they fund most of the research, correct? In all the universities, it's funded by these uh, pharma cartels. And, and so the question is, um, are they really avoiding the work with energy medicine, with, with frequencies, with physics? Because the, you, you won't be able to patent that. You won't be able to patent the code mechanisms of the physics. Well, I, I know expert uh, in, in uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, but of course I've heard many stories uh, about this. And, and usually, usually people respond to the funder. So the funder, if you want more money, um, the results that you get uh, should be pretty much in line with what the funder would like, which means, oh yeah, this is the great drug since aspirin or something like this, uh, um, which isn't really a drug, but um, yeah. And, and there's that tendency. So science, in theory, science should be completely independent of the funding. You know, you should get the money and then do what you can to find truth. But that's not the way the system is working, unfortunately. And, and you're right, a lot, a lot of funding comes from the pharmaceutical industry because they've got a lot of money and they need people to, um, to vet their, their, their products. So there is that, that bias that unfortunately that comes along. There are lots of stories about um, papers being, uh, results being radically changed before they're published. And so we don't know, we don't know what's true and what's not true. Right. Well, you've managed to find a way around that, have you? I mean, how are you funding your research, which is on the frame? Well, I'm not funding my research because I don't have money to fund my research, but, uh, but right now I'm blessed, blessed, absolutely blessed with funding from, two organizations. One is a private foundation uh, situated near Frankfurt in Germany. Um, and the second one is um, uh, a private funder who somehow found me and uh, appreciates our work nice. and is supporting us handsomely. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we don't need to, um, or at least I don't feel any pressure to get one result or another result. This is basic tethered uh, funding from, from good people. And, you know, I hope it continues with this when one doesn't know about the future. Uh, it's really impossible to predict. Exactly. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. Tell us in a very simple terms your discovery with the fourth phase of water. Uh, okay, so we found uh, in simple terms, uh, it's not very complicated. Everybody grows up learning phases of water, uh, the fourth phase. It's not a surprise because more than a hundred years ago, um, uh, scientists were predicting that there ought to be a phase of water. Why? Because with the phases, you can't explain all the experimental observations, even a hundred years ago. And now the number of so-called anomalies of water if you look at Martin Chaplin's uh, uh, website, yeah, I think it's about 65. So, uh, you know, um, when, when you reach a point where the prevailing understanding keeps yielding anomalies one after another, anomalies are stuff that doesn't fit, you know, so you sort of sweep them under the rug and, and hope that future generations will figure out how they do uh, so many of them. And, and so it's not a surprise that there's another phase of water and 
there's a lot of experimental evidence over the past hundred years um, uh, by several prominent investigators in something different from ordinary liquid water, uh, for example. So liquid water, the molecules are randomly disposed to one another, and they're bouncing around a huge number of times a second. So everything is just in the, this fourth thing that we, we discovered and other people um, uh, succeeded with evidence. Uh, the, the molecules are not bouncing around. So, so let me tell you, the experimental lab that led to this was um, we took a um, gel, dumped it in the water, and the water contained little particles, microspheres, among science. And we looked in, we looked in, in the microbe, and we saw that uh, as water met gel surface, something something happened, and and it was these particles got pushed out. It, it was as though there was a zone that was building, and it, it kept pushing out the particles, so something was going on in the zone, and it was not a trivial zone. It was in the first experiments about a tenth of a millimeter, and we have now observations uh, easily up to a millimeter. So this is, this is macroscopic. So what happens, we discovered after, you know, after many experiments, is the water undergoes a transition. The molecules of the water that meet uh, the surface, and it's got to be a hydrophilic or water-loving surface, and gels are, when it meets the surface, what happens it, is it transitions into something different. Um, and it builds layer by layer, molecular layer by molecular layer, each layer having a hexagonal kind of or honeycomb motif. So the first layer builds next to that hydrophilic surface, and then the second builds on the first, and the third builds on the second, and so on. And it keeps building up to, depending on circumstances, it can be up to millions of layers. I mean, it's, it's macroscopic. And, and we did many studies of, of this water and we found several key features. First of all, it's stable. Uh, as I said, the molecules are not bouncing around and very well ordered like a crystal. Uh, secondly, it's not neutral. It has negative charge, uh, typically. Why does it have negative charge? because it builds from water molecules. What happens is water molecules break into and positive components. O minus H plus breaks the molecules. Just like the first step of photosynthesis, molecule of water breaks. And the negative ones go to build this EZ, we call it exclusion zone or fourth phase. Uh, that's what I was just talking about that grows layer by layer. And that's the negatives, and the positives get cast out into the water beyond the that exclusion zone. So, so you have a separation of charge, um, just like a battery. Mm -hmm. uh, and the battery we found can yield energy, electrical energy, and other kinds of energy. It's a storehouse of energy. And and finally, um, just to go over the main main features. You know, batteries, you can't charge a battery from nothing. If you, if you want to run your cell phone, I have none, by the way, <laughs> uh, purposefully, you got to plug it in to recharge it. And so where, where does the charging come from? We found it comes from light, um, and a particular kind of light, infrared light mostly. All, all light uh, can help build this, uh, supply the energy for building this zone. But we found that, infrared energy is by far the, the most powerful, uh, mm -hmm. like a thousand times more powerful than visible light. So, so that in a nutshell, um, that's what the fourth phase is about. Um, so so the, the internet's a little choppy uh, on your side. I don't think there's anything you can do about that. But, it, um, but, but to sum up, the water self-orders itself around hydrophilic substances, water-loving substances, and what you're saying, which actually this bit's new to me, is that the exclusion zone itself is negatively charged. So that has all the oxygen in it from the H2O. Uh, yeah, well, it has um, it, it, the, the chemical formula that we deduce is not H2O anymore. It's H3O2. And H3O2, if you 
if you think about it for a moment, the ratio of oxygens to hydrogens is higher. Yeah, yeah absolutely. One more negative. Yeah, and, and so it's rich in oxygen. Yes. And, and then right outside the exclusion zone. So in the exclusion zone, there is stuff. It's not like a vacuum. It's, it's stuff. It's not a buffer. No, it's, it's, it, absolutely. It's stuff. It's a different, different kind of water. It's the fourth phase that I, I was uh, talking about. So the about. exclusion zone itself is the fourth phase. The exclusion zone is the fourth phase. Right? And then straight, straight outside the fourth phase, straight outside the exclusion zone, there is a high concentration of hydrogen ions, right? Yes, correct. Or protons. Correct. And so that was, my, and, and I was thinking it always when I heard this initially with the May One Ho conference, um, where you presented fantastically. Jim Oshman was there as well. What a great event that was. Um, also, the, uh, the notion of, um, I think it was Hartmut Muller, who, the, the German scientist who, sh who, who talked about proticity, the flow of protons through the biological system. Yeah. So I, I suppose the question comes, when this water self-orders itself around hydrophilic substances, which the entire body is a hydrophilic substance, right? So the body water, is filled with fourth-phase water. Yeah. Right. So fourth-phase water is, and, and again, this notion reminds me of what happened with Albert Svenjorgi when he said that the connective tissue was conductive, uh, that collagen was conductive, and they all went, no, oh, stupid, and they pulled out the body and they dried it, and then they... You know, ah, yeah, if you dry it, it's, and they were yeah. like, it's yeah. not conductive, but of course they're taking it out of context of the body. So I suppose my, my question comes now to how much have we been missing the point when we're talking about studying biology outside of the confines of the environment with which the body actually exists, which is surrounded by easy water? We're missing the essence, the entire essence, because... Um, yeah, well, you know, the body is, everybody knows, is roughly two-thirds water. And if you, if you translate that, that volume fraction into fraction of molecules, you know, if you line up all the molecules in the cell or in the body and start counting them one by one, more than 99 out of 100 are water molecules. Uh, because the molecule is small, you know, and in order to feel or to make up that two-thirds volume, you need a whole lot of them. Right. So people don't realize that more than 99 out of 100 of our molecules are water molecules. And, and yet, if you look at the modern textbooks of cell biology, the word water is hard to mention. You might see it in the first chapter, or it'll say something about water is very important, blah, 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 and then never mentioned again. <laughs> so it's as, it's as though... Um, it's as though the, the, the water inside the body is essentially irrelevant. People think of it as, as the bathing medium uh, in, in which all the important molecules reside. Right. Well, the evidence is the opposite. The evidence is, the evidence is that water plays an absolutely central role in everything the body does. And, and the evidence for that was presented in the book that you mentioned earlier, my earlier book, uh, cells, gels, and the engines of life, which demonstrated that water is so central to, to uh, many, maybe all, I don't know, many of the, the, the major things that our cells do. Right. Um, it's a transition between the ordered, uh, we now call fourth phase or easy water, exclusion zone water, a transition between that and ordinary water is the trigger of of many events that occur. Mm. But the problem, you know, the problem is if it's right, uh, maybe it's wrong, but I think it's, it's right, getting into the textbooks is a, a real hurdle because, because if you're an author of a textbook, um, you want to keep it conventional. If you keep it unconventional, then uh, it won't sell because right. the university won't buy it because they have to teach their students Right. convention because they have to pass the exams and blah right. blah blah so it gets perpetuated yeah. which means which means that um seemingly radical ideas um even if based on enormous evidence right. they it's an uphill battle you see so so to summarize i think biology has gone in in um, in the wrong direction um and many of the mechanisms that you read about in the textbook are so complicated, and I think the reason many of them are so complicated is that they're building on the wrong foundation. And if you have a, 
if you have a foundation with cracks in it uh, and bumps and some rubble, it's hard to build on that. You right. see, you won't get anything simple and elegant. So, so in short, to, to in response to your question, it's not only biology, um, but I, I think physics and chemistry also have gone awry. We've we've replaced the um, well accepted principle of simplicity. You know, Occam's razor. You've got two ideas. The simplest one is likely to be the the correct one, and I believe strongly in that. Um, that nature nature is elegant, operates simply, but but scientists uh, have taken a turn starting maybe close to 100 years ago. I've seen many scientists, my friends, my colleagues stand up in front of the audience and revel in the complexity of what they're doing. Translation, uh, you know, my, <laughs> what I'm doing is very complicated and I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy because I can understand it. I don't know if you understand it, but I can understand it. So pay attention to me because I'm really smart. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so back, back to the discoveries and, and, and the notion about the water. Um, it responds to light and infrared, and of course, cells are more, more responsive to infrared. They mitosis uh, uh, in, in infrared light. And I remember being in the basement of Roger Coghill. Did you ever meet Roger Coghill? Mm-hmm. No, he's a brilliant scientist, a lot of electromagnetic. And there was somebody in his basement, another scientist, forgotten his name now. Anyway, he showed me this experiment that he'd done where he showed it was a, a temperature uh, a controlled environment where he put cells from one part and cells, equal cells, in another part. And it was in a chamber which maintained its temperature. And they showed that infrared information communicated between them because it took more energy to maintain the, the, the chamber temperature than it did if there were cells from two different places. So he said that cells that were the same communicated with infrared energy. Anyway, it was a very elegant and very simple uh, experiment. The point is that that our body communicates with infrared. And I remember that Jim Oshman presented some very interesting things that showed that there wasn't actually enough um, energy released from ATP and TP splitting to account for all the the energy that the muscle has. Were you familiar with those pieces of music from the 70s? I wrote a book on muscle contraction in 1990. It was my former field. And yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, so do we think that potentially there is, informa- there is energy, raw energy, power, uh, being transferred from the water battery mechanism of the EZ water into yes, cells? A- a- absolutely. Um, you know, you have a lot of potential energy there because you have a battery. So where, where you have EZ water, which, which is all over the cell, throughout the cell, giving you negative charge. And outside, so you have um, a potential difference. You have a battery, uh, effectively, and this battery is distributed all over the body. And so the question is, well, do you use this energy or don't you? And, you know, I, I'd say, yes, you use the energy. It makes a lot of sense that you have all of this potential energy and you got to use it some way. And I, you know, I'll tell how I think it gets used. And the issue of ATP, um, yeah, um, there's a, in muscle contraction, it, it's so-called unexplained energy. The, the, the muscle, it's been shown 50 years ago um, um, that the muscle releases more energy, energy in, in terms of mechanical energy and heat, than can be accounted for by the splitting of ATP. Um, Nobody has really been able to pinpoint uh, what's what's going on, but you know it's been demonstrated, and so it makes a lot of sense that you can get energy simply by this separation of charge. You've got a battery, and the battery uses its energy to power the muscle. And boy, does it make sense because if you depend on ATP um, uh, for for doing it. Um, you, you know, you, if you if you come low on fuel, then everything stops. But if you've got potential energy that's up in the relaxed state, you need to be delivered. All of that potential energy is right there, ready to go. So if the frog wants to catch the fly, it's good that there's potential energy to, to, to do it. You know, it's sort of between a sailboat and a motorboat. 
you know, sailboats are fun. And in Hawaii, are probably on a boat every, um, and uh, it depends on the, you know, if you've got wind, you don't go anywhere, right. uh, except where the tide will take you. But if you have a boat, you know, you have potential energy stored in the fuel, and fuel can be, so you can actually get where you want to go. Certainly a motor back uh, yeah, in the motor. And, and I think that if you think about Mother Nature and her wisdom, it makes a lot of sense to for the body, for the cell, whatever it wants to do, to have that energy right there, ready to go. Absolutely. Now, so a, a question with this, because I'm, I, you know, a student of Jim Oshman's, and obviously the connective tissue and the collagen fiber, and you know about Albert Svenjogi was the first yep. person to contract a muscle in a petri dish, as you know. Um, Excuse me, the first person to contract a muscle? In a, pe in a Petri dish. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that, but I oh, know yeah, yeah. he was yeah. really prominent. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. In that's, that field. That, that's Jim. Yeah, that's that's yeah. direct from Jim, that. Um, okay. and, so, um, and, and, and so the collagen fiber, the connective tissue, the most abundant material in all living matter, I mean, apart from water, um, it's conductive. So electrons are flowing through this. And, and of course, we can now show that there's, there's protein molecules, which are also conductive in the same way, which cross over the cell uh, wall, uh, integin, integins, integins. Integrins, yeah. Integrins, thank you. I always say it the wrong way. Um, and, and so there's, there's a conductive mechanism that, that has from the extracellular matrix, the collagen, across the cell wall into the intracellular matrix and microtubules and all that stuff. My question comes, is water and the EZ water somehow up uh, uh, um, passing electrons, flow of electricity, of charge into the connective tissue, which then goes into the cells and maybe even into the mitochondria as like a, a sort of powerhouse. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I, I can't really come seriously on that because I haven't thought about it. But, um, you know, in terms of passing electrons, sure, absolutely. Easy water um, uh, that would surround the collagen and and it's been demonstrated that there is some kind of structured water that surrounds collagen, experimentally demonstrated, uh, can certainly pass current. And, and the body is just full of <laughs> currents all over the place. So, so yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that these currents will, will, uh, will get uh, transmitted. I don't think there's m much doubt about that. You know, the body is an electrical machine. Um, and, and those who have studied it really understand. But but, uh, um, you know, and as an electrical machine, of course, it's subject to, um, uh, subject to, to the influence of outside effects like electromagnetic radiation of all sorts. Um, and, and in our, even in our mouth, um, having feelings that are made of metal, um, you know, um, especially mercury, which is poisonous, but you have two different metals in your mouth um, because most of the feelings are amalgams of several different metals, you get current between them. And having current flowing in your mouth near your brain would seem to be um, to um, um, ideal operation of the brain. Right. And a lot of this has been demonstrated. And and um, started reading a book called The Invisible Rainbow. I mean, know this book. The um, Invisible Rainbow. Invisible Rainbow, and the author's name is, um, I'll think of it in a moment, I'm sorry. Um, right. uh, the Invisible Rainbow. Uh, I think it's going to be a classic. It deals with electricity and body, uh, written by a guy who studied medicine but knows physics. Uh, uh, Firstenberg is his name, F-I-R-S-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, Firstenberg. Uh, and awesome. it's well, well written, and it discusses electricity that has been um, introduced in various stages around the world. You know, we haven't had this since the time of the Greeks. This is right. a modern invention. And, um, and coinciding with the introduction of something new in electricity, it was always um, side effects on humans, uh, yes. increase in rate of this disease or that disease. And I just flipped through the pages and it looks like it's it's very well documented. And so, you know, the issue with 5G and right. people are finally finding out about how potentially dangerous this is. I'm sorry, I deviated from your question. That's but, okay. Um, That's okay. But this, this is, is, 
but we're electrical machines. And of course, as electrical right. machines, we're subject to outside electrical influences. Right. And typically they're not positive. Typically right. they're negative, right. although occasionally they can be positive. So, right. and, so and anyway, this, I, I And this is going. showing that the entire environment of which we're surrounded by is this electrical battery effect, which is influenced by infrared and can actually fuel and power pretty much everything about us. Our well, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know that it's everything, but, uh, but the ATP story uh, has serious limitations. It's not just what you mentioned earlier about muscle contraction, um, which I've known about for a long time, but, but also, you know, uh, Gilbert Ling pointed out, Gilbert Ling is a scientist who just passed, uh, he never quite made it to 100, and he spent a good part of his life dealing with structured water, what we call fourth phase or EZ, although it's a little different from what Gilbert suggested, I think. Um, and, and he points out, I, I hope his website is still live, I'm not sure if it is, but he points out that after the initial discovery that ATP had a high energy bond, um, which could deliver energy to the body, which is still in all the textbooks, uh, a paper came out one year later saying these guys who suggested ATP, they're wrong. They made an arithmetic error in their computation. There's no such thing as a high energy bond in ATP, you see. And nobody, according to Gilbert, nobody's ever challenged that critique, you see. And the idea stuck because, hey, it makes sense someone finally identified where right. all that energy is coming from. And so the idea is perpetuated and I don't know if it's right or not, but um, um, but I, I certainly think that the people who are serious about that particular subject um, deserve, <laughs> the world deserves for them to look at right. this critique and see if the critique is valid or not valid because it's so important. Yeah, and as you say, there's so much investment in this status quo that that's gonna be hard for anyone to uh, you know, retract all those textbooks that explain that ATP is the, is the source. Um, so just uh, what, what is your view then on, obviously water is very important, everyone knows that, but it's even more important with regards to the electrical energy and even brain, you know, power. Um, how, how do you uh, understand water memory? And what's your take on the things like the Emoto pictures and, uh, and Jack Benvenisti, if you ever came across him for when he was working in Paris? On, on encoding water with memory. And how does easy water, does it hold, have, you, have your experiments shown that it holds any memory anywhere? Uh, well, we, we, the last point, we have preliminary evidence that it does, but there's actually massive evidence uh, 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 that water can hold memory. And I think the memory is actually in the easy water because easy water is, it's sort of like a computer memory. You know, if you, think about, if you think about a computer memory, what is it? Well, it's silicon atoms that are um, arrayed in a, an, an, a three-dimensional, uh, basically a three-dimensional array. Um, and, and each one of those can be addressed and uh, it has two states. And actually the mechanism underlying that I think is still a little bit obscure, but it, in some way it works because, you know, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be communicating with you. Right. Uh, and, and, and somehow each atom can be in one state or another state. We call it zero or one off, on off. And so the easy water is actually rather similar. The oxygen, oxygens, which are in abundance in this, in, in this array are organized in, um, in, uh, as I said, each sheet is, is a uh, honeycomb-like structure with oxygens at the vertices. And the next sheet is the same, although displaced slightly laterally, and the next sheet and so on. So you have a three-dimensional array of oxygens. So it turns out that oxygens um, have not one state or even two states, but five states. So if you look in the textbook, you'll see that oxygen has five so-called oxidation states. Minus two is the usual that we learn, but there's also minus one and zero and plus one and plus two. So the point is not only, um, uh, in, in, at least theoretically, 
not only does easy water have the capacity to store information, but it has the capacity to store enormous amounts of information. And I, it would not surprise me at all if in a decade from now, your computer memory is filled with easy water, not silicon, uh, because the information density in theory, in theory is much higher. Now, as far, as far as evidence is concerned, I think the first, what you might call modern evidence <coughs> comes from a guy named Gurvin in Russia. And so he took, he took onion plants um, and um, you know the onion plants will grow and, and the roots, the cells and the roots will undergo mitosis at their own rate. So you've got one, one plant sitting uh, on the left side and one on the right side and, and each one undergoes its cycle and there's no synchronization or anything like that. However, when he put them close, not touching, together, he found that the mitosis in one synchronized with the mitosis in the other. It's, it's like uh, women living together, their periods uh, uh, seem to get synchronized, that, that sort of thing. And he investigated further. He said, there's got to be some communication between them, but they're not touching, you see, and how do they communicate? And so uh, he put various barriers uh, between them. And um, if I remember correctly, um, when, when he put glass between them, there was no more communication, but it put quartz between them, there was. And so the difference between the two is that, is that the quartz is able to pass UV um, and infrared, I, I, uh, I think, but the, the glass doesn't do so, especially UV. So he, he was able to, uh, to conclude that the, the information is light, some kind of light, and probably UV light that is communicating information from one plant to the other plant, even over a distance. Um, and that, that, that's where it all began. And, what, was uh, his, what was his name, Jerry? Gurvich, G-U-R-W, well, it's Russian, G-U-R-W-I-T-S-C-H or something like that is, yeah. is the I'll pronunciation. Yeah, his experiments are well known in Russia. And then, you know, yeah. people started studying more seriously. Go on, you had a question, sorry. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, um, so you mentioned Jacques Benveniste. Yeah, and Jacques was my friend. Um, uh, he not a close friend, but a, a friend, and he was a pioneer, um, uh, especially in in the area of water memory. and And the story uh, with with Jacques, uh, um, he was a famous immunologist. Someone came to his laboratory and said, "Hey, whatever you're doing," and he was putting antibodies on particular cells, and they would secrete. The guy came to his lab and said, I can dilute um, your antibodies and dilute and dilute and dilute to the point where at least statistically there's nothing left but water. And I get the same result. And homeopathy, Jacques, basically. Basically homeopathy. Yeah, yeah. I think the guy may have been a homeopath. Right. And, and uh, Jacques said, well, I don't believe that. But, you know, I've got a big laboratory, 50 people. You go sit in the corner, do your thing, and we'll look over your shoulder. And, right. and before long, everybody was looking over his shoulder because he was getting that result. Yeah. And being an intellectual, Jacques became really curious, and they, uh, the lab shifted in that direction, and they began doing experiments. And, and the idea, um, and Jacques told me that maybe he used the wrong term. He called it water memory because, because this was a specific reaction that he was dealing with. You put antibodies, and you get some something uh, released from the antibodies in a very specific way because other antibodies wouldn't do that. You right. had to be specific. And yet, you could take the, the correct antibody and dilute and dilute and dilute and nothing left but water. So the water must have some information left over uh, from, right. from its contact uh, with that. And that was inflammatory. Um, really? and, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, so, shadow, like a shadow point, some, somehow. You know, it, 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 so homeopathy is obviously a massive topic, but, you know, people can, can look into that. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, pulsed energy and how pulsing, how the space between things affects uh, living mechanisms. You know, we, we know those experiments initially where they 
shone light through a spinning disc. I can't remember who did that, but showed that the cells mitosis better when there's a pulsed light given to them rather than the same light just continuously. So it's the on and off phase of things. And I'm wondering if that has featured in your easy uh, experiment. Well, no, it's not. But, uh, you know, I know about PEMF treatments. I may be getting one tomorrow uh, myself. Right. Uh, but I, I, I'm sorry. I, I really can't comment on that's that cool. because I, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I want to stick, yeah. to, your, stick to your specialties. So, so the exclusion, exclusion zone water uh, has all these different potential phases to record information inside it um, yes. and also it's got an ability to act as a as a um, separator of charge from the water separates the yes. protons and then the electrons how how may this relate to some of the un um unaccepted uh, flows of energy through the body like prana and chi and, 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 and this, this kind of acupuncture. So can it relate to acupuncture and the movement of energy in some way? I, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for that uh, to occur. I, I don't, um, um, uh, th there was a paper long ago about the meridians. Someone suggested that the meridians actually have structured water. I think it was a Korean, a Korean group. Right. And, uh, you know, since the conductivity of EZ is, going to be, uh, because of the easy flow of electrons, it's going to be different from, um, from where you don't have easy. It could be that if there's a, some, are there some easy pathways um, that <coughs> the acupuncture points, maybe strategic points that where if you stick a needle in, it has some influence on, on the conduction through, uh, through this is a possibility. Mm. I think it needs to be researched in the future, but you know, since, since the body, the, uh, to, to, to those who have thought about it and thought about EZ, body is much different from what you read in the textbook and therefore lots of options open. And uh, I think you're onto something, uh, when, when you suggest that, um, that, um, prana, um, you know, chi, it may actually be related to easy because we're talking about energy and, and, um, and the, the energy that comes from the Ayurvedic culture or the Chinese culture, um, you know, they, they seem to be rather vague concepts. Uh, it is vague in terms of what we, we, know, we know right now. But with the information about easy water filling your body, there's ample opportunity, I think, to research these and to see whether indeed uh, they're the same. So I met a guy in Saudi Arabia. I gave a talk there maybe eight or nine years ago. And a young fellow came to me and he said excitedly with a Koran in his hand, he said, he said, the easy is the soul of the body. And, you know, it's a little, it's close to what you were talking about, about uh, chi, prana, uh, energy, uh, being a soul. And at the time, you know, at the time I quickly dismissed him. I said, hey, you know, I've got enough problems with my <laughs> academic life. <laughs> I don't want to start publishing a paper. He said, we should publish a paper together. And I've lost contact with the guy. I, 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 I wish I could contact him again because I think he might have been on to something. You know, it's got information, it's got energy. Facebook, uh, Gary, that's your way. Get, find him on Facebook. I think you could find him if you wanted to. Well, maybe I can. Yeah, give, me I, his, I, give me his name, I'll find him for you. I'll do it later. I have to find his name again. I, okay. uh, I, I have to look it up. Um, so, so, so with regards to that, there's, there's a potential with that. I, I do want to get on before I end, we're, we're coming close. Um, I do want to talk about how we can increase exclusion zone water in us. Like, it's, it's great to understand the mechanisms and, you know, it's good to try and help people to, to increase that. Um, just quickly, I know it's not a quick topic, but what about the hydrogen ions that are, that are, that are what interested me a lot about the EZ water is how much the concentration of hydrogen ions um, um, split. Like, it wasn't, you've got the exclusion zone water and then everything outside is just normal water. It was like a, a sort of immediate intensity of hydrogen ions. Is there a flow through that part? Is the movement 
of energy, of, of protons, of proticity through that increased concentration of hydrogen ions right next to the easy water. Totally. Uh, that's a really good point that you make. And we studied it and, um, and it, it does flow. And the reason it flows is, is those protons repel each other. They want to get away as far as they can from their neighboring proton. See, some will stick nearby, uh, hover around the negative charge of the easy, but the ones that are initially farther away will repel each other and go every, every which way. And that every which way we studied in some detail, we found, for example, inside of a tubes made of hydrophilic material like straws, you just simply put the tube in the water and the water flows through it. And, and we think it's, it's that reason that, um, that you've got the tube and an easy builds, um, an annular easy builds inside negatively charged. Right. And in the core are protons and it starts filling up with protons and they want to get out of there, right. right? So they'll either go this way or this way. If they go this way, they'll pull more water in and it keeps going. And we, um, we discovered recently, the paper is almost, uh, uh, a manuscript is almost finished, that the same thing occurs in your cardiovascular system. Um, if, you, if we were to stop your heart, we're not planning to do that, but you know, <laughs> Uh, and depending on your behavior, uh, we stop. We stop your heart. The blood doesn't stop flowing. It flows more slowly, but it, it keeps flowing. And we demonstrated this in the lab, uh, in a setup. And there are half a dozen papers published over the past, past hundred years that demonstrate that if you stop the heart, the blood does not flow, does not stop flowing. It keeps going. Right. And we started to see whether, whether. Um, uh, the mechanism that I just described, putting the tube in the water, yeah. whether that might actually occur, and all results were positive. Amazing. So, yeah, and we, so, so we can water that keeps us alive. It's like a backup generator system. Yeah, or maybe not backup. We don't know. It's a generator, right? right. Yeah. And and it may be responsible for many of the flows in your body, including flows through lymphatics and veins yes. and whatever. Yeah. I have a quick, quick uh, uh, question. Have you looked at any toroid shapes? Because of course, the toroid seems to be this shape of the universe, uh, and and it keeps coming back to both consciousness in the psychology of things and the biophysics of the universe, both at the extra large and, and micro. Um, seems to be this toroidal uh, shape, this sort of donut toroid. Uh, have you done any experiments with how easy water would behave around such a shape? No, but I, I, can, I can predict how it, it, it might because, well, it lines, if you have a toroid of the right material, uh, the EZ should form a, a layer like, um, like the icing on the cake, right. you see, and it should be relatively independent of shape. So if there is a, a toroid, and, you know, I've seen lots of speculation, but not much evidence, mm -hmm. but, you know, then around the toroid, uh, if water is, is, is nearby and energy, um, infrared or other energy is nearby, you should have an easy layer that coats the toroid. Right, right. And, and so uh, like a helix could be considered a toroid of sorts. Same thing. You would expect uh, any, any surface, doesn't matter what the surface is, right. if, it, if it's hydrophilic, and not every hydrophilic surface does it, we found some that don't do it, but basically most hydrophilic surfaces build easy water under the right conditions. So what about DNA? Sure, absolutely. There are studies that show that there's some kind of structured water around, around DNA. Absolutely. And so will there be a flow of things through the DNA? Because I was wondering if the DNA is like a, a funnel, just kind of like a trumpet that is blowing the information from the collagen fibers the connective tissue and exclusion water, because they're interlaced, right? Around every bit of collagen is structured water. So it's coming along for the ride. Yeah. Uh, it, through the cell wall into the microtubules, that's the hammer off stuff, and then down into the, into the nucleus, into the, into the DNA. Is this a kind of, a, a sort of a transmission system from the outside world, a kind of reverse Francis Crick, kind of <laughs> downward, uh, you know, epi Well, yeah, I mean, Every, essentially, every molecule that's inside your cell and outside your cell uh, uh, too, usually the, the, 
the hydrophobic entities are buried deeply in the molecule, whereas the hydrophilic, the charged surfaces, are exposed to the water. Mm. Um, and it, 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 might even, it might even be that um, the molecules chosen by nature um, to fill your cell are only the ones that can actually build easy water. Um, right. uh, we have no evidence for that. It's a speculation, but right. I, I think it, you know, it, 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 it makes sense. So, I love it. so I any of the things you're talking time. about, sorry, I could, I could keep, keep talking to out for hours with you, Jerry. One, one last question, mitochondria, how, how hydrophilic is mitochondria? Have we any idea? Well, I don't, I don't know that anybody studied it, but uh, the, the structure of the mitochondria is exactly ideal for building easy water. And I think the mitochondria is filled with easy water, supplies negative charge to the cell and keeps the cell basically charged up. Um, and and th this may be another, another way of looking at the energy that comes from uh, mitochondria. Um, uh, that, that's how I look at it absolutely yeah. that was where i was going with it and I, somewhere intuitively i've got this idea that the mitochondria is somehow these nodal connection points of the prana of the chi and somehow they, they are like um like you have transmitters in wires in order to get electricity across a long space you have to have these nodal um uh, converters these trans transducers that that sort of take it yeah. and push it on yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if the mitochondria serve a similar sort of purpose as an energy passer on, as a, like a beacon point, like a Wi-Fi, uh, uh, you know, readmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see where you're going. And I think you're right. I, I mean, we haven't studied mitochondria in any detail, but, you know, that structure, the characteristic structure of the mitochondria with membranes sticking on a regular basis is it's just exactly right for building easy water. Right. And right. of course, there's an electrical potential from inside and outside, so that fits as well. So this is something that remains to be explored, but I think it's quite possible in that you don't really need pumps or channels or any of this right. gadgetry. Right. Uh, there's a good deal of evidence against. I know this is the prevailing view, and by now the number of pumps and channels, each one exceeds a thousand. There's running out of space in the parking lot. Exactly. Oh, God. I, I, you know, Jerry, I'm, I'm, we've, we've got to end, but it's been uh, amazing. Uh, uh, people can find out more uh, about your work at pollocklab.org, uh, and um, you're always open for people to getting involved in terms of financing uh, research. And um, have you got any um, courses open for people to study with you, uh, to come up and do internships? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Money is the limiting factor and the lab right now is full, <laughs> full of people. Um, and with the economic situation the way it is, who knows about the future? Yeah. But yes, absolutely. Uh, people who, who are interested, I'm interested too. One. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much for coming on, Jerry. Um, oh, my pleasure, Mark. I, I love your work and, and thank you for, for, for bringing uh, easy water to the forefront. And um, uh, it's just such important work. Well, thank you. I appreciate your kindness. <laughs> Enjoy thank Hawaii. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm just okay. the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Right. Oh, wow. What a brilliant show. Uh, exclusion okay. zone. So uh, basically it's showing that water is far more complex or as Jerry would put it, simple. It's elegant. There's an elegance to water and it self orders itself in order, uh, uh, enabling uh, these, this split this battery effect inside the body. So there's a, a potential mechanism because the battery increases with infrared light and yep. infrared light from the sun. And so there's an- Or metabolism. Right, so there's a, and metabolism. So there's a potential um, um, harnessing, almost our photosynthesis uh, into yeah, yeah, yeah. the body. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, first, first step of photosynthesis is exactly that. It's the splitting of water by right. light. Yeah. into OH minus H plus. Exactly. Uh, it's the same thing. So I think what we've discovered is a kind of generic first step of photosynthesis. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, and so, um, and so uh, the simplicity is, is important. Um, we, can, we can understand that, that this might be a mechanism for how water uh, starts to encode memory from a, from a, 
um, homeopathic and from a water memory in the cells where, where we're encoding things. If indeed our memory is not in the brain, but encoded inside the body, it makes sense that it's spread over this quantum computer mechanism of the H3O2 in the exclusion zone, water, because it has all these possible mechanisms of the O2. You, you have not just the one on and off, but you have five different mechanisms. So you're yeah. e ending into a sort of quantum computing, uh, 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 endless store of information inside the body system. So when we're trying to get rid of information in the brain or trying to recode ourselves, it isn't in the brain. It's totally in the body through every single cell communicating through every cell. So look to your inner being when we're exploring psychological, physiological, emotional stores of memory. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And, and enjoy Hawaii. Um, you will do. Uh, okay. And take care. Thank okay. you. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, I have a book, bookevolve.com, bookevolve.com, oh. check it out. Uh, once again, thank you to my guest, Jerry Pollock. Thank you to you for watching. Please uh, like, share. I think the share button is the important button. And uh, see you all tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Bye.